Margaret Neal is the Adams Distinguished Professor Emerita of Management at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Her teaching and research focuses on negotiation and decision-making, collaborations, the allocation of burdens and benefits, learning in groups and teams, group decision-making, and diversity. In a nutshell, basically everything. <laughs> she is a professional of everything. In addition, Professor Neal has conducted executive seminars and management development programs around the world. For those of us that, or for those of you that joined us a couple weeks ago, we had some technical difficulties. <laughs> we are just so happy <laughs> that you are back with us today. Maggie, thank you so much for being here. Please take it away. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Robin. And let me add my appreciation for those of you who have shown up uh, a second time. I appreciate the fact that uh, sometimes the technology is simply not going to cooperate. Let's hope it does today. So let's talk about negotiation. And one of the biggest hurdles, especially for women, is that most of us look at negotiation as a battle. And that battle is characterized by, I'm gonna to try to get stuff from you that you don't want me to have. And I'm gonna to try to keep you from getting my stuff. And if that's how you think about negotiation, you're already in an uphill climb. And the reason is because this negative frame, this perspective of battle of negotiation creates a filter through which you evaluate your counterpart's behavior. And because they are the other, they are the enemy, they are the people who are keeping you from getting what you want, you're gonna interpret their behavior in the most malevolent way possible. And in addition, if you think about having this battle mentality, it really encourages you to think about who's gonna win and who's gonna lose. And that win-lose perspective creates a pressure for you to try to win, and sometimes winning becomes more important than what it is you have won. Now, there are clearly negotiations that are adversarial, but for you and for me, most of our opportunities for negotiation take place with folks with whom we have or have the potential for a relationship. So what that means is if you think of negotiation as a fight, you have to pick and choose your negotiations based upon which counterparts you're willing to pick a fight with. And so what I'm gonna suggest is that there's a better way. First, we need to rethink the definition to move beyond the simple notion of negotiation as a fight to negotiation as a process where two or more parties decide what each is willing to give and hopes to get in their interaction. And the next clause is so important. And through a process of mutual influence and persuasion, there is no command and control in negotiation. I can't force you to say yes. All that I can do is present proposals where from your perspective, it's your, in your interest to say yes. And we agree on a common course of action. Now this definition is very broad and can incorporate all sorts of interactions, some of which are incredibly adversarial, but some of which are situations where you might not even think of them as the possibility for a negotiation, like, for example, consider an ex a common experience for me is my research meetings. When I call my doctoral students to a research meeting, the content of that meeting is about how to create a better research project and how to move that project forward. But the context of that meeting is, which of my scarce resources will I contribute to this particular endeavor and what do I hope to get? And there, my students, they are doing exactly the same thing. So every meeting in which you wish to have influence is an opportunity for negotiation, but you're not gonna take advantage of those opportunities if what you think of negotiation is a fight. You're gonna to have to pick and choose again who you're willing to fight with, and simply that's just not something we wanna have as a characteristic that people think about when they think about us. So. What I want you to do is I also want you to rethink your whole perspective about negotiation. Move from framing your negotiation as a battle to negotiation as collaborative problem solving. Now, before you get to moving much faster than I am and say, oh, I already know what that is, that's that win-win perspective in negotiation, you know, where everybody gets together at the end of negotiation, there's a big group hug, kumbaya, there's, you know, unicorns and balloons and rainbows everywhere. No. 
When I talk about collaborative problem solving, there are three criteria that you need to meet. Number one, to basically be in a situation where I, as the protagonist negotiator, am better off, better off than my status quo, better off than my alternatives, better off than had I not negotiated. Now, while that may seem like a low bar, I challenge you, I suspect that all of you, as I, have been in negotiation situations where at the moment before you said yes, you knew you should walk away, but you said yes anyway. You took an outcome that made you worse off. So first, we need to sort of focus on what makes us better off. Number two, because there is no command and control in negotiation, I need to understand my counterparts because my counterparts have to voluntarily walk this path of agreement with me. So I need to understand them. I need to understand their motives, their, their preferences, their interests, and their problems. Because I've got to be able to craft a proposal that from their perspective at least keeps them whole and perhaps makes them better off. Otherwise, there's no reason for them to ever say yes. And third, and most importantly, when I craft that proposal, I am going to frame that proposal as a solution to a problem that my counterpart has. You see, too often we get caught up in a negotiation thinking about what's in it for me. But because you need to be so aware that negotiation is an interdependent process, my counterpart has to come with me on this journey. So I'm gonna frame my proposals as a solution to a problem that they have. Now this turns out to be actually a challenge. Why? Because you've got to be creative in how you frame and characterize your proposals. You've gotta plan and prepare. You've gotta understand your counterpart. The good news is that folks tell you their problems all the time. And I encourage you to listen carefully to their problems and see how creatively you can frame a solution to those problems in a proposal that makes you better off as well. Now, once you do this, everything can become negotiable because you're no longer having to pick and choose your negotiations based upon who you're willing to fight with. But you've gotta be careful because now when so many things become open to negotiation, you have to be clear about what you're trying to achieve in each of these negotiations. And let me be really clear here. The goal of a negotiation is not to get an agreement. Getting a yes is not the goal of a negotiation. And what I wanna highlight is what researchers have talked about as the allure of agreement. And so I've got this graph here um, this figure. And I want you to look at the relative positions of the orange bar, of the orange line, and the blue line. In the blue line, this is the uh, results of, of negotiators and, and subjects in the experiment who were asked to make a choice between two options, option A and option B. This is the percentage of folks who chose option A. Option A was a disadvantageous option. Not so much so that nobody chose it, but you see that depending upon the particular experiment, somewhere between a low of 4% to a high of about 35% chose option A. The experimenters then simply changed the label that they used in the choice. Instead of saying option A versus option B, it was the agreement option versus the no deal option. Same choice and look at the orange line. How many more people thought, hey, this was a good idea. So that space between the orange and the blue line is really the bias that we have to agreement. So when folks say to you, if you can just make this concession, we have an agreement. They have reduced the friction for you to make a concession. And of course, you've done the same thing. But I wanted to sort of quantify how powerful that allure of agreement is because what you really want from your negotiation is a good deal. And so now you need to think, well, okay, if what I want is a good deal, then how do I know what a good deal is? And what I wanna to suggest to you is there are at a minimum three components that you need control of before you begin a negotiation. The first is what are your alternatives 
if this deal does not result in an agreement. What we're asking here is what happens to you in the case of an impasse? We're looking here at alternatives. How good or poor are your alternatives to this particular negotiation? There has been an enormous amount of research to look at the impact of alternatives on negotiator performance. And while there's lots of details in that research, the main finding is strong and consistent. She who has the better alternatives on average walks away with more in the negotiation. Why? Because the better your alternatives, the easier it is for you to walk away or to convince your counterpart that you will walk away if you don't want to. Because if I have a really good alternative, you're gonna to have to pay a premium to me to stay in this negotiation because otherwise I can just invoke my alternative. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news. Most of us, when we think about our alternative, we kind of characterize it as, let's say my alternative is here. If I just exceed this, I am doing well. What you have just done by that cog cogitation is you have just anchored yourself to your alternative. It now becomes a standard for acceptability, acceptable outcomes. What I want to suggest to you is that a better way is to think about your alternative as a safety net. So imagine yourself a trapeze artist and you are performing before a large audience and somewhere in your act, something happens and you end up in the safety net. This is not an acceptable performance. You're not happy with what happened, but you're in the safety net. And because the situation was resulted in your being in the safety net, you're really glad it's there. That's how I want you to think about your alternatives. It's not a standard that determines what's acceptable or good enough. What it is, is it is a mechanism that protects you from the downside, from the fall. Now, your alternatives are outside the negotiation, but they affect the negotiation process itself. And they do so through their impact on your reservation point, your bottom line, your point of indifference between a yes and a no. This is arguably the most strategic piece of information that you have in your negotiation. That is, what is the point at which your negotiation goes from an outcome that you could say yes to, to an outcome that you must say no to? In fact, if you are negotiating and you're at your bottom line, another term for your reservation point, if you're at your bottom line, you should be so indifferent that you're willing to flip a coin and if the coin comes up heads, you walk away. And if it comes up tails, you say yes. That's how indifferent you should be. Your reservation point is a bright line standard that you do not violate. How easy that is to say, how hard that is to do. And just what I want to suggest to you is that what successful negotiators do is they are clear in understanding that regardless of how much they want a yes, that if the deal violates their reservation price, they simply say no. Now, if all you think about is your alternative, your safety net, or your reservation point, the worst possible deal you could say yes to, you will systematically underperform in your negotiations. And this is sort of writ large for women. And the reason for that is because women have lower expectations on average, at least the empirical research suggests that. So what you need to do is literally leverage up your expectations about what is possible. And that is through setting an aspiration, an optimistic assessment of what you could achieve in this negotiation. And if you can leverage up your expectations, you may not you may not realize, you may not achieve your aspiration, but setting an aspiration will result on average in your walking away with more in the negotiation. And because women historically have had lower expectations, this is so critical. Setting an optimistic assessment. If this negotiation went well for me, what could I achieve? Now, you can have those three components, 
but you still got to decide to negotiate. And I want to sort of highlight the importance of why women need to engage in negotiations. And the, one of the most powerful ways I can do that is to, to, to describe a study that was done um, with 184 managers from a very large organization. They were divided into two groups. They were both male and female managers. And they were told that they had a specific money, amount of money to allocate to their subordinates who were equally skilled and responsible, both male and female subordinates. And so there were two conditions. In the first condition, they were told simply, we need, we have this fixed pool of resources. Please allocate these raises to these equally responsible and skilled employees. And in that condition, there was no difference in the allocation of raises to men or women. However, in the second condition, the managers were told that once they had allocated this fixed pool of, of money, that the employees could come back and ask for an explanation and perhaps negotiate with them about the raise they were given. And in that condition, the managers, both male and female managers, gave the male employees two and a half times the raises they gave the female employees. In this case, women were at a disadvantage before they even started negotiating or even had the opportunity to negotiate. Why this difference? Well, when, we're, when negotiators, when, when, sorry, when the managers were asked why they did what they did, they said, look, when we give women raises, they're not gonna complain, but men will. So men will come into our office, but not all men and not given every raise. So if we give them a high enough raise, a lot of folks won't come into our offices. So what they'll do is they were very instrumentally taking money from Jane and giving it to Bill to keep Bill out of their office because they knew Jane wouldn't negotiate. So why don't you negotiate? And oftentimes we need to think that we don't even think about it as an option. There are so many situations where we can, we, we potentially have the opportunity to negotiate, but because we have a motivated misperception that you can't negotiate here. And I want to dispel that perception. There are so many situations where people think you can't negotiate. And I just want to suggest that you have to ask. In fact, one of the things that I do with my students at Stanford is in the first assignment, they have to go out and negotiate a fixed price item. And they need to bring back proof and the item that they have purchased that item for less than the fixed price. They have to go to Nordstrom's or grocery stores or dry cleaners. They have to go to places where you don't normally negotiate and bring back proof and the item that you can. And by the way, when I first give this assignment, about 15% think they'll be successful. But about 85% are successful at the end of the assignment. So what I want you to think about is the opportunity to negotiate in situations where most folks would say, you can't negotiate here. And I would challenge you, try. But there's a big other group of situations where people know other people negotiate. Let's say, for example, you're being made a job offer or you're being given, offered a promotion. And you say to yourself, I know other people negotiate, but I'm concerned about the adversarial nature of negotiation. I don't want to get a reputation for being greedy or demanding or not nice. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take that job or I'm gonna take that promotion and I'm gonna do really good work. And then when my employer sees my really good work, then I'll get what I deserve. Have those thoughts ever run through your mind? And if they have, how'd it work out for you? Well, I can tell you that for me, I'm pretty sure my dean likes me. And when I do good stuff for the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, I'm pretty sure he's pleased that I'm a faculty member but I can also assure you that when I do really good stuff for the school, he doesn't think, hmm, I'm wondering if we're paying her enough. Just doesn't cross his mind. So 
Let's talk about the choice to negotiate. And the way I wanna do this is I wanna highlight a piece of research you may have heard about. Linda Babcock uh, is the co-author of a book called Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide. And what led her to write that book was her stint as an associate dean at Carnegie Mellon University. She was a negotiation researcher. And as associate dean, she did what we all did, uh, we all do, and that is we send out exit interviews to the MBAs as they leave. And so one of the questions was, what's your starting salary in your new position? And what she found was the starting salaries of men were 7.6% higher than those of the women graduating same year, same degree. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this could happen, but it turns out that because Linda was a negotiation researcher, she asked a second set of questions. And she said was, when you got your offer, did you attempt to negotiate the terms of your employment contract? And what she found was that only 7% of the women, while over half of the men, attempted to negotiate for more money. She also found something she said, how successful were you? And she found no difference by gender. So everybody who negotiated on average got about seven and a half percent increase in their salaries. So at this point, I think it's interesting for us to talk about the cost of not negotiating. And the way I wanna do that is I want to do that through a thought experiment. So I want you to engage with me in this thought experiment. So suppose at age 30, two equally qualified applicants, Chris and Frazier, get job offers for $100,000 a year, okay? And they're working for the same company. Now, Chris negotiates. Now let's say Chris gets an increase of 7.6%. So Chris starts out at 176 Frazier accepts the $100,000, and now we're going to make two heroic assumptions. Number one, they stay at the same company for the next 35 years so we can see what happens. And number two, the company treats Chris and Frazier identically. They give Chris and Frazier the same 5% raises annually. Okay? Now, Chris retires at age 65. So the question I need to ask you is, how much longer do you think that Chris, that Frazier will have to work until Frazier makes as much money as Chris did when Chris retired at 65. And I just want you to think. So all we're saying is how much did that decision 35 years ago cost Frazier in terms of additional years of work? And I guess I'm wondering, would you be surprised if the answer were seven years? So in order for Frazier to make as much money as Chris did in 35 years, Frazier has to work 42 years. Hmm. So maybe that negotiation thing may be important to pay attention to. But it gets worse because this was a very conservative estimate of the difference. Because, you know, what happens if you think about this? Over the course of those 35 years, while their salary started off very close, 107, six and 100,000, over those 35 years, the difference between their salaries now at the 35th year is more than $100,000 a year different. So how does the company, how does the company interpret that salary difference? Well, they're probably going to say, Chris is more important. We pay Chris more. Nobody's going to say, oh, you remember 35 years ago, Chris negotiated and Frazier didn't. Nobody's even around who still believes and remembers that, right? They may not even be alive. So let's say that Chris gets half a percent, five and a half percent over those 35 years, while Frazier gets 5%. You wouldn't even notice that difference on a year basis. But over 35 years, how much longer will Frazier have to work now? 18 years longer. And I'm going to do one more and then we'll stop. What if Chris got 6% as a raise every year and Frazier got 5%? Now how many more years? 47. Frazier can't live long enough because Frazier's got to be over 100 
before Frazier will earn an equivalent amount of money. So the cost of not successfully negotiating one's starting salary could be an addition seven to 47 years of work. Yes, this is an extreme and hyperbolic statement. I want this to be embedded in your minds. And if you do the math and you realize I still don't want to negotiate given the cost, then I hope you like your job because you'll be working there for a lot longer for a lot less. So let's talk a little bit more about women, why women don't ask. And there is a significant amount of research that gives us some insight. When we negotiate a single issue like salary, women are less likely to negotiate than men, but it's for a good reason. It turns out that evaluators penalize female candidates for asking for a raise in ways they don't penalize male counterparts. Particularly, male evaluators penalize females for asking for more while not penalizing their male counterparts. Now, there's a little bit of good news in kind of a weird way. Female evaluators penalize both male and female candidates for asking for a raise. So at least the playing field's level, it's still not good. Why do they do that? It's the perception of not being nice and being too demanding that explains the backlash. And so part of what I also wanna highlight is it's not just the, penal, the penalties that women experience, it's a combination of the penalties with the low expectations that they will actually achieve their outcome. And so you bring those two together and it's clear why women are less, are more hesitant to negotiate. We also have done some research recently uh, to try to understand this a little better. And it's a little bit different because we, part of the, what we're trying to figure out is, uh, is it the case that women are too nice when they negotiate, that is they, they aren't pushing hard enough? Or are they getting a backlash when they try to negotiate? And so we have two competing hypotheses. Women aren't sufficiently assertive, that's the tameness account, or that women are fine in terms of assertiveness, but they get backlash. So we, we basically, collected data for five years, got 2,500 individuals who were in uh, executive education programs from around the world. And what we found was a very interesting effect. What we found first was that there was no difference in negotiation performance by gender. So the notion of women not asking wasn't really a possibility here because everybody in this data set were all in a situation where they knew they were going to negotiate. So this difference between the propensity of women not to ask and for men to ask is gonna be uh, mitigated here. What we looked at, what we found a very interesting finding, and that was when women had good alternatives. So in this situation, negotiators could have good alternatives or poor alternatives. And of course that means they were facing counterparts, both male and female who had good or poor alternatives. And what we found was is that when female negotiators had good alternatives and were facing counterparts with good alternatives, that is two equally powerful players, women were six times more likely to reach an impasse with their counterpart, male or female, if it were a male with a good alternative. And this finding strongly supports the backlash account because what we find is, and we can sort of see it in this graph, it basically, we have a strong alternative and males actually um, got a whole lot more. And when you see the dark box here, this is a female with a strong alternative. Uh, and you see that in fact, they got significantly less. And that was whether we included the impasses or we excluded the impasses, the effect remains the same. So one of the challenges is, is that when women act assertively in negotiation, there is pushback from their male and female counterparts. And so what I wanna to suggest to you is, we need to think differently about how we negotiate. What I would like the world to be is that there would be a level playing field and I wouldn't have to basically say to, you, to women, you have to behave differently in order to be successful. But in this case, there continues to be evidence that the playing field is not level, 
And so women have to behave differently in order to get more of what they want. <coughs> so what has to happen? Women have to act differently. They have to ask differently. And it turns out, and this research has been going on for quite a long time, that women are going to be much more effective if they pair their ask with a communal concern for the other. Now, what do I mean by communal concern? Well, it turns out that's that collaborative problem-solving approach. How can my ask help you achieve the goals that you want to achieve? You see, this is so important because if women simply ask for themselves, they get pushback. And so if what we can do is we can couch our ask in a solution that helps my counterpart and make it clear how that solution does solve problems of my counterpart, we change the nature of the conversation. No longer is this a battle. Now we're simply trying to find solutions to problems. And so what I wanna highlight is the power of the ask. If you don't ask for what you want, how will others know what it is you want? And the, one of the ways that I wanna highlight this is that I wanna give you a, a really sort of um, bad news, good news kind of perspective. And so it turns out that when women ask for themselves, they typically get less than their male counterparts. You know, and this is equating everything. Same vitas, same person, you know, but just a male versus a female, right? Same verbs, same words, right? Women will get pushed back where men don't when they're asking for themselves. But when asking for others, women are more successful negotiators than their male counterparts. In fact, when asking for others, women outperform men 14 to 22%. This is a huge difference because what this says is, and this is a very important data point, because what this says is it's not that women can't negotiate. It's that when we do negotiate and sort of ask for, for assertively what we want, we find ourselves in a backlash situation. But when we ask for others, there's no backlash. You can't, you know, I don't get accused of being greedy or demanding or not nice when I'm negotiating for my organization or for my team. Where I get those accusations is when I negotiate for myself. So this is why the problem solving perspective is so important. Remember that first criteria. I need to be better off than my status quo, better off than my alternatives, better off than had I not negotiated. But I couple that aspiration with trying to propose or, or framing a proposal as a solution to a problem that my counterpart has. And all of a sudden, the conversation is different. I want to highlight the power of the ask, because if you don't ask for what you want, now you may have to be clever in how you do that, but if you don't ask for what you want, who will? And so what I wanna do is, I wanna say a couple of things in closing before we open this up for questions. And one of the biggest challenges that I think women face when they're negotiating, actually not just when they're negotiating, but in the world, is the competence versus likability paradox. So it turns out that men can be competent and likable. But women are often faced with the choice whether to appear competent or to appear likable. That is, competent women are often perceived as not likable, and likable women are not perceived as competent. So the question that I would like to have you consider, and I think this is not something that can be answered 
in the moment. It has to be something that is answered over time and again and again. How much are you willing to pay to potentially be perceived as nice and to avoid, and to avoid the discomfort of asking? And why I want to be highlight this notion of potentially be perceived as nice. Because as you are more successful, as you move up in the organization, in your organization, as you take on leadership roles, there are going to be people who do not like what you do. And we all want to be liked. And so there is a tendency, if we have to choose, sometimes we choose likability over competence. But what I want to suggest to you is that you may want to think about disentangling the situations where you are competent and where likability is really important. And so what I want to suggest, if likability is important, and by the way, it is important. I want people to like me. But I also know that sometimes I have to make tough decisions in my role as a faculty member, in my role as an administrator, in my role as a mentor, that makes people unhappy. And they find that I'm not particularly likable in the moment. Well, what I've learned over time is I can come home after work and my husband will say to me something like, well, how was your day? And I'll tell him and then he'll go on about his business. But I have three dogs. And when I come home from work, whether I've been gone on a trip and I've been gone for a week, or I have just gone to the grocery store and I've been gone for an hour, they're like, oh my God, you're back. It's so wonderful. We thought, we thought you were gone forever and our life was so sad and lonely and dark without you, we're so glad you're here. You see, if you really wanna be liked, I have a solution. Get a dog, or better yet, get a rescue and save two lives because they will love you unconditionally. And that's where you can get your likability needs met. At work, I'm not saying don't be likable, don't be personable, but don't sacrifice competence for likability. So we need to be strategic in how you ask. I'm encouraging you to embrace that collaborative problem solving perspective. I cannot overstate how important that is. You see, you can think about it from my perspective. I do research and negotiation. I teach negotiation. I write books in negotiation. And so my colleagues, and I've been an associate dean, when my colleagues, I get into a room with my colleagues, they're like, oh, you're negotiating. And they start putting on that battle armor, getting ready for a fight. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I might negotiate with people out there, but with you, we're gonna problem solve. It diffuses the situation. It changes the conversation. I wanna encourage you to embrace the notion that negotiation is collaborative problem solving. Because what you're trying to do is trying to influence people to move in directions that otherwise they wouldn't go. And part of the way to do that is to be able to leverage the opportunity to help them at least be whole or perhaps made better off. So another closing thought, especially for women, for whom do you negotiate? because you're gonna do a much better job when there is somebody else for whom you are negotiating, whether it's your team or your organization, or perhaps you're negotiating for all those women who come after you. So those 184 managers don't take away from Jane and give to Bill because they know Jane will just take it. Jane won't complain. Jane won't try to change the situation. So if you wanna know more, here are a couple of things I wanna suggest as opportunities for extending your knowledge about negotiation, influence, and the collaborative problem-solving approach. The first is I wanna highlight Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashabeer's more recent book, Ask For It, How Women Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want. This is a book that is directed towards wise practitioners. So 
Read this book, get this book. It's really very useful. I'd also encourage you to perhaps explore work by Robert Cialdini on influence. Uh, he has a 2009 book, which is an amazing uh, discussion of influence and how to be more influential in situations. He also has two recent books. One's called Persuasion, which was published in 2016, which focuses on uh, setting up the situation so that your influence is more powerful. And also a, less, a book he wrote uh, a little bit earlier called The Small Big. These are small influence attempts, interventions that can have big impact. I also strongly encourage you to read an amazing book that was written by, oh, me, uh, in 2015, published there, Getting More of What You Want, How the Secrets of Economics and Psychology Can Help You Negotiate Anything in Business and in Life makes a great holiday present, so feel free. Um, also, uh, please take the opportunity, if you wish, to explore my website, gettingmoreofwhatyouwant.com. Uh, there are video clips, there are articles there, there are blog posts. Um, you know, there's just all sorts of stuff that's there. I kind of throw up whatever I do, I kind of throw up there. You can see some uh, other examples of lectures I've given. Uh, and you can actually see my co-author, Thomas Lisi, has at least one short video there so you can see what he looks like. And with that, I think we are open for questions. Maggie, thank you so much. I really, I've heard that. Um... I've heard that webinar a few times from you, and I just really enjoy it. And every time I take something else away for it, thank you so much. We have many questions. I, I would like to start with something that I think that a, probably a lot of us think about. So we made the decision, we've mustered up our courage, we're going to go in, we're going to negotiate. Question is, how can we gain insight into the pay and benefit ranges for our role so that we know when we're going in, we're doing ourselves a favor by starting the negotiation from a competitive place. So, you know, the world has made this a whole lot easier than it used to be uh, mm -hmm. because we have all sorts of, of resources on the internet which can give us information about, like Glassdoor is an example, where they attempt to ask people, and it's it's not verified, so you need to take these things with grains of salt, sure. but uh, people, people give their their um, job category and the, the, the uh, salaries that they have. So you can begin to get an idea. Um, and there's lots of these type, types of websites that are out there. So that's one way. Uh, but you know what, what I find much more useful is something that I've been doing even before we had these kinds of websites. And that is, um, I have a group, I'm actually use my network. And so when I am, am thinking about going in for a, for a negotiation around my compensation package, I'm going to gather information from my friends. And it er, turns out early on, um, you can imagine, I got my PhD in 1982, and there were very few women uh, business school professors at the time. And so a group of us got together. There were about, uh, about seven of us at the time who were all coming out of the same year getting our PhDs. And we, uh, we were meeting at a national meeting, and we said, you know what? You know, we're, we're a very small minority here in, in business schools. And so we're concerned that we're probably not being paid equitably with our counterpart, our male counterparts. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to form a posse. And the posse's task is that over time, we're going to share our information about our salaries, about our compensation packages, anything that we can do to help each other. Uh, and that's the, that, that's the pack we made. Because, of course, it's uncomfortable sharing information about salary and compensation packages. Why? Because, number one, you don't want to feel bad. Oh, I'm the one making the worst amount of money here. Or you also don't want to make other people feel bad in case you're being paid more, but it might make you feel a little good, right? Mm -hmm. So what right. we did was we made this pact, and um, that pact was made in 1982, and here we are in 2020, and I actually got an email about six months ago from one of the members of the, of the posse who said, I'm going up for some compensation conversations. Where, are, where is everybody? And we all respond. So my, my suggestion to you actually is use the internet to get that kind of information, but also use your network and 
also you might not you might use your expand your network and you could certainly ask people who have jobs that are similar to the one that you're thinking about or the one that you have and say i'm considering a you know asking for a raise in this amount would that be reasonable that way you're not asking them how much do you make but you're saying you know do you think this is a i mean am i underpricing overpricing or right at the right pot place for me and and I applaud your your idea that you need to get information because you absolutely do. Uh, you need to know what the what the market is and where you are in that market. So um, you, there's a variety of sources, internet sources, your network, and then maybe a posse that you may have created um, to help you um, support your um, your options in this kind of context. Excellent, thank you. I think that was a really good way to frame it too. So if you're feeling like under the gun to ask some specifics, you can say, would I be out of line if I said this? That's, exactly. a, that's a perfect, it gives them an out, mm -hmm. perfect. Um, I really liked this question. I thought probably a lot of us can take something away from this. Can you provide some tangible examples of positioning your ask communally? For example, in an offer negotiation, what are some specific tactics we might be able to use to negotiate in concert which, with what may also benefit that individual recruiter, hiring manager, or the business? How can we, if, if we feel like we're negotiating something very specific for us, how can we put in some communi community to that? So it turns out that this this will lead, you know, so we only had 45 minutes, so there are a lot of things I didn't talk about. So I'm gonna add, start talking about them now. And one of them is that you shouldn't be negotiating a single issue. I am, I research and I are powerful opponents of negotiating issue by issue or a single issue like salary. Because you it's really hard as the questioner here you know implies to be communal when I'm saying, hey, I want more money. Right. right. So what you need to think about is what is the package? Remember, so you may have heard me over in the last answer. I said, talking about my compensation plan, not my salary, my compensation plan, which is a multi-issue conversation. So I would strongly encourage you as you go in for a, a conversation with your um, with your employer uh, about these kinds of compensation plans is to have multiple issues around things that you think would be helpful for you to do your job better. And that's the real mindset you want to have. What are the resources I need in order to do my job better? This becomes communal because most of our employers, our superiors, are evaluated based upon how well their subordinates work, right? So we yep. are now aligned. I want to do a good job. You want me to do a good job. Secondly, you already know some of the challenges that your managers face. And how can you, with additional resources, step up to the challenge of helping your manager solve his or her problems? So remember, what you're trying to do here is understand that they have to have, they have to be motivated to say yes to you, right? And so, you know, I can give you an example of what I did when I negotiated with Stanford. So there were a couple of things that were, um, that were actually unique to me, right? Why they were interested in hiring me. One of them was I'd had a lot of success in, in training and placing doctoral students. And another was I'd had a lot of success in teaching. And it, at Stanford at the time, in the business school, there was this very strong cultural norm that if you could do research, then you couldn't be a very good teacher. And if you were a good teacher, you couldn't do research. And the dean was very motivated to break that cultural norm, that good researchers could also be excellent teachers. And excellent teachers could also be good researchers, right? He wanted to make that change. So he was looking for people who could fit that mold. So I actually was successful in teaching and research. And so what I provided when I, when I had my negotiation with him about possibly coming to Stanford was, here are the package, here's a package of resources that I will need in order to train doctoral students well, in order to do my research, in order to be able to teach effectively. And it, these are the things that are challenges to Stanford and my skills and abilities can help, help you mitigate those challenges. Here are the resources I need in order to do that. Right. And so that I think is, is really important because you see, 
There's a reason why they're trying to hire you. What are your skills and abilities? Are there a reason why you're promoting you? What opportunities can you use for that at that point in time to say, okay, here are the resources I need. Maybe I need some quiet time working from home to be able to, you know, I mean, this is pre-COVID, right? Quiet time working from home uh, to be able to do some, some, some thinking in ways that I can't think at the office because of all the interruptions. So maybe I need two days at home. I need to, I need to telecommute. All sorts of things, whatever. Do I need a bigger marketing budget? Do I need better technology? Do I need, what do I need? Do I need more lab space, right? What do I need in order to do my job better? Excellent. Great. Putting it in a package approach. So giving them some things that maybe some give on and making it, how can I help you help me help you? <laughs> yes, exactly. Perfect. Um here is a question that came in that I think is applicable probably to a lot of people since we're in COVID right now, which has um, been a challenging time for businesses and institutions. If you have found yourself in a position where there's a hiring freeze, so let's say there's a hiring freeze or there's a stop on budget or something like that, or we're not hiring any more people and you want to negotiate your position, how can you kind of navigate that? Well, a hiring freeze isn't a promotion freeze. So there's that. that number one, maybe, you know, be, and, and secondly, um, I have, you know, in my decades of being an adult and being in organizations, I've been through a number of hiring freezes. And let me just go back to the first thing I, one of the first things I said, which is the importance of asking. I cannot tell you the number of times I'm a rule follower, basically, and, and it's taken me decades to kind of unconnect un, un myself with that rule following propensity. Uh, you know, I, I was told there was a hiring freeze. So, you know, therefore, I didn't even ask for a promotion or a raise or anything. And yet colleagues of mine did and they got them. Right. So, you know, I don't actually believe much of what I hear anymore when they say this is an absolute, absolute rule. Nobody gets X or Y or Z. And the answer is, well, maybe, maybe not. So let's see. And if I can ask in a way that helps my counterparts figure out that they're better off by saying yes than saying no, then maybe there's an exception to be made. So right. that's number one. It's just to really say, okay, uh, let's be clear here about what what is and is not true. And there are a lot of things. I mean, I had a dean once, uh, not my current dean by any means, but I had a dean once who whenever a faculty member went in to ask him for something, he always said no. Because his, his, his theory was, if I say no and you go away, it must not have been very important. But if I say no and you come back and say, well, let's reconsider this and let me tell you why this is why no is the wrong answer, he said, then I'm going to listen to you. But just because you ask for something doesn't mean you're going to get it. You actually have to make a case for it. Sure. And I think that's a good point about a rule followers and probably a lot of our participants are, I, yeah. I am that, I am that rule follower. They say, well, they said, or I talked to the boss, you know, so I, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions come in about understanding how race and age play into negotiation. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in how black, indigenous, and people of color should ask for an increase compared to a white person? So there's very little research. Um, and so, I, so there has been a, a one or two studies done with um, African Americans. Um, and the answer is that as you would expect, um, the bar is set higher for people, for African-Americans, I'm gonna generalize to people of, people, people of color, um, because, uh, you know, there's just, there's, there's so much, um, you know, systematic racism and discrimination that, and it's so, and, and sometimes it's overt and sometimes it's very subtle. So my suggestion, again, this is, you know, it, this is not um, a function of the studies. The studies just show the difference. And what we find is, is that people are much less willing to grant raises to people of color um, and to women. 
All right, so it's the same kind of thing. My suggestion to you is that you, it's even more important to embrace this collaborative problem-solving approach and to really move away from thinking of negotiation as a fight. Go in there with an expectation that you're trying to solve a problem for your counterpart. Because think about this. How difficult is, for, is it for people to think you're greedy or demanding or not nice when you're helping them solve their problems? So change your mindset. And again, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of research, but, but the research that we do have does, does not bode well. Um, it turns out that basically white guys have a benefit and the rest of us don't. Right. So lean hard into that communal ask. Yep. Um, thank you for that. Next question. Is this discrepancy or focus on niceness that you talked about cross-cultural, the same across the U.S., or across different technical sectors, for example, medical, tech, engineer, finance? Do you know any of, um, any of that information? So um, it turns out that, um, that uh, basically the role of women, and I'm, and, and, and I'm going to Put, you should put all this in quotes. This is a hyperbole, but, it's tr but it has a lot of support in empirical research. The role of women is to make people feel good. And, you know, whether we're in California or New York or in, you know, uh, Iowa, uh, the role of women is to make people feel good. And when you ask them for more money, you're not making them feel good. And so you get pushback. And so part of the reason, part of the reason that I have, I have settled on this collaborative problem solving approach is because we are often, women are often called upon to try to solve problems. We've been doing that a lot for all, most of our lives. And so it is a natural form of engagement. And so as such, it allows us to be more effective given the social situation in which we, of which we are a part. It is not a whole lot different uh, across uh, across the across the continents, um, women's role is particularly oftentimes characterized as uh, being more in terms of caretaking and collaboration rather than quote agentic, communal versus agentic, right? And so my my suggestion to you is embrace it uh, until the world changes. Until we're in a place where we can change the world and we do change it, then realize that that communal perspective you'll be able to be more effective in getting what you want if you leverage that perspective. Absolutely. Thank you, Maggie. That was all the time we have for today. Just to round back, I did have a number of questions about books, resources, or links that Maggie would recommend for us to dig deeper into this process. You can see her um, information up here on her last slide. She also have, we have linked her website in your dashboard as well. So you can go there directly. And she's given us a number of insights and books that we can all um, look to for more information. Also, Maggie has a negotiation course within the SINE certificate. This was, <laughs> yes, this was 45 <laughs> minutes today with a 15 minute question and answer, but her course is 10 to 12 hours, depending on how speedy you are. So you might want to check that out. And we have also linked that in the dashboard as well. Thank you everyone today for joining us. We are so happy to have you. Thank you for all your questions and your participation. Uh, thanks for showing up. Maggie, thanks so much for showing up. It was a pleasure to have you today and we will see everyone again soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Robin. Take care. Stay safe. Be healthy. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.